previously on Expose. Every once in a while, there'd just be some sort of offhand comment that was like, yeah, it's one of those other erased cases, those ones that nobody can find out about. Brad took them and put them in an isolated tent, and it wasn't ours before he showed up and tried to molest those boys. And Richard Scarborough is writing letters to Boy Scout leadership and then high church officials like at the Salt Lake City level saying, this man is a pedophile. He should not be a scout leader. The three R's of protection, recognize, resist, and report is the Boy Scouts of America's message to the young people of our society. It questioned two things that people here really like. It questioned religious authority and the Boy Scouts. Funding for Expose has been provided by In 2005, the Idaho Falls Post Register ran an investigative series about a Boy Scout leader who for years molested boys while he was promoted to ever higher posts. The series raised questions about the judgment of officials at two beloved local institutions, the Scouts and the Mormon or LDS Church. The church and scouting are deeply intertwined in eastern Idaho reaction was immediate. People wanting to know, why are we doing this? Why can't you just leave this alone? Why are you, know, you're just trying to sell papers? The first person I deal with early in the morning is a little grandmother, and this woman wants a piece of me. And it was, uh, you know, why are you taking on the Boy Scouts? And to a lesser degree, uh, why are you taking on the LDS Church? She says, are you a Christian? and she lights into me about ruining these men's lives. But that was the first thing, and I thought, man, we are in for it. Although the series inflamed some in Idaho Falls, it also had supporters. We had a pastor come in and shake our hands and said he was very proud of us. Here, people don't like to talk about things like molestation and abuse, and it happens. And I think people were really happy that we even brought that, even could write about that and talk about it in that way. The backbone of the Scouts Honor series was the story of young Adam Steed blowing the whistle on a serial pedophile who molested 24 boys. For Adam's younger sisters and his father, Paul Steed, seeing their story in print brought back memories of what it was like when Adam and his younger brother came home from camp in the summer of 1997. The first response of the people, the, the young people who were supposed to be my kids' friends were, you were a willing participant. You're a pervert. You know, you're a homosexual. I remember my brothers coming home from school over at high school and they were just, they were so sad because people would accuse them of going along with things when they, they were victimized and they were abused. You drop them off for some activity. Everybody would be over here together and your kid's standing right there. And it hurts. Reporter Peter Zuckerman broke the story, one of the biggest ever to hit Idaho Falls. He had expected some kind of reaction, but not the one his mentor Dean Miller now told him was brewing. He says, people are going to go after you personally for this story and they have said that they're gonna do what they can to make your life miserable. It 
started as a whisper campaign in the community. Zuckerman was gay, and that had influenced his reporting. The whispers made their way to the Steed household. We said, Peter, why don't you eat dinner with us? And he said, oh, I'm really busy. And we finally talked him into it. And I said, just tell me, are you gay? And they got really quiet. He said, yeah. And I said, fine, that's, that's just fine. And then he said something absolutely profound. He said, the critics of what you and I are doing, the story that we're telling, are using the fact that I'm gay to discredit me. He says, isn't that ironic that I'm gay and I can't imagine somebody molesting a child and most of these pedophiles are married or confess to be heterosexual and they think nothing of molesting children on a wholesale basis. The fact that Zuckerman was gay made the newspaper when a local corporation got involved. Frank Vandersloot is president and CEO of Melaleuca, a multinational company which reported $783 million in sales in 2006. He doesn't like our opinions page, and he's sort of the chief critic of the Post Register. Vandersloot is a big figure in town. Melaleuca helped fund a gleaming new ballpark, and every 4th of July, it puts on a spectacular fireworks display. Frank Vandersloot also has a history of taking on the media. In 1999, unhappy with a documentary which dealt with homosexuality, he was among those behind the effort that put up billboards like this one, which appeared across Idaho. Now, upset by the paper's investigative series on the Boy Scouts, Vandersloot conducted his own investigation. His company soon took out ads in the Post Register, which were deeply critical of the Scouts Honor series. One ad claimed, quote, the Post Register's real intent was to smear the Scouts good name and take away what the Scouts value most, their honor. I don't mind having somebody here who's keeping us honest, who's asking the hard questions, particularly someone that you don't have any choice but to pay attention to. <laughs> you don't, you don't um, ignore Frank. As a self-described fan of the Scouts and a member of the LDS Church, he challenged Dean Miller to a debate on local television. Get ready for Tough Talk on Local News 8 with Carol Honus. My point is that the Post Register tried to make them look like villains and I tried to make so. it look like there was a cover-up. No. Tried to make it look like there was I complicity disagree. between... Well, I think you have, a, you have a bias against the Post Register and you're going to put us in the worst Listen to what your readers say. Finish. And I think that, that what you've done... In the community page, the name of the paid advertisements in the Post Register, Peter Zuckerman's sexual orientation was a topic. One ad called Zuckerman a gay rights advocate and said, quote, There is nothing wrong with having homosexual reporters, but since the Boy Scouts' policy of not allowing homosexual men to be scout leaders has produced so much anger against the scouts from the homosexual community, it seems that if the Post Register had wanted a fair and balanced story on the Boy Scouts, they would have assigned a reporter who did not have a personal axe to grind. I had a couple of people who, after they'd read Frank's ad, were really all over me. Why did you let a gay man do this story? He's got an obvious conflict. I don't know. If I'd had a mom do the story, she'd have an obvious conflict. She's got kids. In Frank Vandersloot, the newspaper had an influential critic. There were other reactions. Police chief Kent Livesey was particularly moved by the Post Register's account of Adam Steed's bravery. 24 kids. How many of those 24 kids came forward before Adam Steed did? Probably none. A lot of these guys that molest young boys were molested. And so they know that when you're molested as a young boy, uh, you're not going to run off and tell anybody. You don't have to threaten that you're going to kill their family or you're going to anything. Because you know, chances are, they're never going to tell a soul. Livesey was part of a group of Idaho law enforcement officials who gave the former scout an award for speaking out and stopping a serial pedophile. In talking about the story of Adam Steed to Expose, the chief publicly revealed something deeply personal for the first time. Well, I thought the series was great. Uh, my heart was with, uh, was with Adam Steed uh, 100%, I, and I think that's another thing that quite 
uh, splits communities when these things happen. I think there's uh, people that have been abused, especially boys, uh, uh, being, a, being a, a man and having been a boy. Uh, in fact, I was, uh, I was uh, sexually abused uh, when I was a child. Happened in the Boy Scouts. Now, I don't have anything against Boy Scouts because of that. I sure wouldn't want anybody to misunderstand that. Uh, I mean, what were the circumstances? I didn't tell anybody about it for years and years and years and years. Years and years and years. With his sexual orientation out in the open and public suggestions that his journalism was biased, Zuckerman says life in a small town got scary. And it did create a dangerous situation. And in fact, there were people coming to Peter's door at midnight, beating on the door and harassing him. I mean, I worried I would get hurt that somebody would just randomly shoot me or something. I mean, I really saw the dark side where it brought out the worst of the worst. While Zuckerman struggled with the backlash from his reporting, his stories were still reverberating throughout the community. As soon as we published, we started hearing from lots of other people. And we realized this was not isolated. In fact, this was a pattern that persisted, that there were scout leaders who were pedophiles who were not drummed out. I just start getting tons of phone calls. And among those phone calls are people who say, wait, this happened to me too. One of those calls came from Jeff Bird. Bird is married the father of six, a Mormon. The articles brought up memories of a traumatic event in 1983. I felt devastated when I read the article because the same thing had happened with different players, but it was the same thing. It happened again, and more boys were hurt, with a whole new person hurting them. Jeff Bird was an avid scout. He'd achieved scouting's highest rank, Eagle Scout, at the age of 13. Two years later, Bird became a junior staffer at Island Park Camp, where he was befriended by a camp counselor named Dennis Empey. He was a very popular, charismatic person. All the guys liked him, and he liked me. And he kind of took me under his arm and showed me around and made me feel like I was popular as well. But one weekend, when Bird was alone with the scout leader, he saw another side of Dennis Empey. Empey carried a gun, which he used, he said, to kill rodents that lived in and around the camp. He had a 44 revolver that he took care of him with. And you know, the things he said and did made me believe that he would use it on me. Jeff Bird still has trouble talking about what he says happened at scout camp when he was 15. Uh, Dennis invited me to come stay with him in his tent in the central staff area. And so I did. And he kept weapons underneath his cot. And I couldn't get away from him. There were no other adults. I had nobody to, to run to. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't go anywhere. I didn't even know where the next human being was. In a sworn affidavit, Bird has said he was raped that night. Here is his account of what happened when he tried to tell the camp director, Kim Hansen. I was very scared, I was crying, but he was quite angry, he was quite stern with me. I was devastated. Kim Hansen went on to become the head of the local affiliate that runs the Idaho Falls Boy Scouts, the Grand Teton Council. Hansen's actions regarding a serial pedophile in the late 90s had been scrutinized in the original Scouts Honor series. Now there was an allegation from 1983 Kim is now head of the Grand Teton Council, whereas when this happened to Jeff Bird, he was the director of this camp at Island Park. And so you, 
now you see this career arc where this guy who's accused of making poor decisions, you know, has made them before, and it, it's all of a piece. And so there's a connection. After his alleged assault on Jeff Byrd, Dennis Empey left Idaho and moved to Utah. In Utah in 1991, he was arrested and pleaded guilty to two counts of forcible sodomy on a child and one count of sexual abuse of a child. Dennis Empey was bending over small boys and having forced anal sex with them to the point that they screamed in pain as it happened. And he did it using a gun to threaten and intimidate them. I couldn't imagine that Dennis Empey was still alive. I couldn't imagine that somebody's dad hadn't just gone up and shot him, frankly. I mean, I, I know that sounds terrible, but it just, you, I, I couldn't imagine my response to finding out what Dennis had done if it had happened to my son. As they investigated Jeff Byrd's story, Dean Miller and his wife Tracy, a former paralegal, made a startling discovery. Dennis Empey was back in Idaho some 20 years on and contributing graphic design work to the Grand Teton Council. The holy moment was when Tracy found Dennis Empey's name on the Grand Teton Council website. Yeah. And you can see that with the, the tagline, image courtesy of Dennis Empey, and we're thinking, is that the same guy? Could that be? Um, he's back and he's working for them again after everything we've just read about him, after everything they know about him. Now Dean Miller had a slew of questions for Kim Hansen. But as happened with the Scouts Honor Series, his calls were not being returned. Looking for answers, Miller sent Hansen a certified letter. Hansen responded saying that due to current litigation, the Grand Teton Council would only respond to questions in one area. In recent years, Dennis Empey donated graphic designs to the council. All materials were sent by either electronic means or mail. He has not been in our office and has not had any volunteer position. Miller followed with another letter, without success. I said, you know, Jeff Bird served as a junior counselor at Island Park in 1983, yes or no? In June of 83, Jeff Bird reported to Kim Hansen that Dennis Empey touched him inappropriately. Kim Hansen did not report Jeff Bird's complaint to police or to appropriate authorities in the area Boy Scout office. So, I mean, I was sitting there saying, look, guys, this story is so incredible that there must be something wrong here. On July 3rd, 2005, Four months after the Scouts Honor Series was published, the Post Register went to press with Jeff Bird's harrowing story. Fallout from that story would come much later. Peter Zuckerman was growing weary of life with his sexual orientation in the spotlight. He told his mentor, Dean Miller, that he had had enough of life in a small town. He filed his last story for the Post Register in late July 2005. I bring people here, the deal is you come here, I'm going to work you like crazy, but you're going to learn a lot, you're going to improve as a journalist, and you know, that's a fair deal to me. Peter got a raw deal. You know, he came and worked his guts out, he did a story that was incredibly important to this community, and he got his teeth kicked in. It was mixed. It was this relief that, gosh, I'm finally away from what seems like such a crazy place. Then also just sad that I had to leave this project that I felt like changed me so much as a person. And I felt upset at the time. It seemed like nothing had changed. But change was coming. I remember the first thing that happened after the story came out. That morning, we were getting ready for church, and the phone rang, and it was Paul Steed. Paul Steed taught at a local Mormon seminary for 12 years. But after the Post Register series of articles about his sons, and after meeting other victims like Jeff Bird, he left his job as a teacher and dedicated himself completely to a new cause changing the statute of limitations to better protect Idaho children who were the victims of sex abuse. Stephen Wright, the Post Register's attorney, explains. If you had been abused as a child, you basically had five years until after 
you turn the age of majority. So you'd have until you turn 23 to do something about it. For more than a year, Steed organized victims and others in Idaho to join in the fight. As an unpaid activist, Steed lived off his savings. The family eventually sold off most of its furniture to fund the cause. Everything came down to when we had our very first hearing in the House Judiciary Committee. We had 200 people show up, and most of them were victims. Jeff Byrd told the packed room that future generations should be able to expect justice whenever they came forward to report abuse. People told him he was a hero. I don't feel like I'm done with this situation, but it, it, it was wonderful to have somebody say, yeah, that was wrong. What you did was worthwhile, and it helps. And it helped the situation. And it, I wasn't expecting that. What we did was we came in and completely removed the statute of limitations on a childhood sexual abuse. So if a person comes home forward at 40 years old and says, see that old man over there? He molested me. Uh, our state does not grant amnesty to him. The bill was signed into law on March 13, 2006, by then Idaho Governor Dirk Kempthorne. At his side were Adam Steed and his family. I'm just so proud that um, my dad would do something about it and like change it for other families and, and their kids too, so that their brothers don't have to go through such a hard time. In April, the Post Register published a story about calls for Kim Hansen's resignation. The community page, bought by Frank Vandersloot's Melaleuca Corporation, defended Hansen. In May 2006, a new ad praised him as an effective administrator with a clean and respectable record. The ad also called Jeff Byrd's account of events surrounding his rape impossible. It read, Bird says that the incident happened in June of 1983 at scout camp in Island Park. That was impossible because there was no scout camp in Island Park in June of 1983. Bird points out that the Grand Teton Council's own website establishes that the camp was founded in 1974. His affidavit says he arrived in June of 1983, and the assault happened, quote, at the end of the first three weeks of camp. He goes on to say, if Jeff Bird was mistaken about where it happened or what happened, could he also be mistaken about what scout leader he talked to or exactly what he told the scout leader? I couldn't describe what had happened to me because I'd never heard of it before. So I used the best language that I had to describe to Kim what had happened to me, and he just became angry at me. Well, and as for his claim that he's confused about who he talked to, Jeff had known Kim for over a year before this incident. Kim signed Jeff's cedar badge certificate the year before this. Kim was my supervisor. I know exactly who he is. I could find him today. In November 2006, Kim Hansen retired from the Grand Teton Council. You know, the paper didn't do anything hard. We just did our job. But Jeff has taken huge risks, you know, and it's had a big toll on him. Paul Steed, good Lord. I mean, the guy has just really given over his life to trying to solve this problem. I mean, that's courage. We, we just, you know, we got the story and reported it. Idaho's elimination of the statute of limitations for child sexual abuse isn't retroactive. It won't mean justice for Jeff Byrd. All the same, fighting for the law and getting it passed has changed Jeff Byrd. I don't like victim. Victim is like you're sitting there and you have nothing to do. Okay. I'm not so what do you want to be? Okay. I want to be somebody who doesn't take <laughs> <laughs> It's PBS, I think they can say that. Your mother died. <laughs>
funding for expos a has been provided by